I feel a certain level of responsibility in making this video land. I tend to stay away from what is popular and in the mainstream, especially with these kinds of momentary spikes involving indie hits. The closest thing I've gotten is Deltarune, which really was just made due to my excitement for the game. It's arguably one of my least important videos, but still, it's something I wanted to make. Many of you may be scratching at your heads that I have yet to bring up my Hello Neighbor video. And while yes, the argument could be made that I covered a popular trendy indie horror, Hello Neighbor was well dead at that point. With Hello Neighbor 2 coming out, the franchise is slightly less dead, but when the video first came out, the original and the franchise in general was very much dead. This then leads us to Poppy Playtime. Now, why I made this video may not be satisfying to you all. I felt a lot of pushback when announcing this topic, and I can understand why. What is there left to talk about? And heck, with only two chapters, why even bother talking about a 40% completed game? While I can't answer all those questions, I at the very least want to provide a straightforward analysis of the game. Because at least in my opinion, from a gameplay perspective, Perspective, this game completely slipped under the rug. Anytime I had heard anything about the game, it might have been a sheep rampage explaining some of the controversy involving one of its developers, and then I'm watching just staring at these two hands on the side of the screen. Now, this sounds dumb, but a lot of you might be in the same camp. Was it just me? Huh. So today, let us dive into the inky depths. <laughs> Wrong game. Let us dive into this abandoned factory and see what Mob Games has in store for us. CHAPTER ONE! We start off Poppy Playtime with a VHS intro, which I know this may not be the most original or even gripping of starts, but they did a fantastic job. The VHS look is so overdone, and I have been seeing the same kinds of tricks being applied, i.e. something that was super impressive five years ago. Well, to me, it's just a basic VHS effect. However, Mob Games really spent the time to perfect the look, and I think it looks quite convincing. Now, I'm not gonna beat around the bush here, guys. This game has so many things going for it and against it. Let's start off with the setting. Visually, the game looks great. That's been a pretty defining characteristic, it seems, with most popular indie hits. Having a distinct art style is definitely something that seems to attract a crowd. The lighting and general composition of the rooms feels great. For now, we're only talking about chapter one, and while they couldn't really get too creative, especially with the short length, still, the general presentation looks nice. Like, look at this shot, how the glass panes of the building are letting light seep in, drawing emphasis to the middle with Mr. Large and in charge over here. Speaking of great, in the same scene, you might have noticed the little blue monstrosity. Well, this, my friend, is Poppy. <laughs> Despite being on the face of all the marketing and being the freaking antagonist of this chapter and likely one of the main baddies in this game, he is not the titular character of the game. No, my friends, this cookie monster reject is named Huggy Wuggy, which is just such a fun name to say multiple times. I'm calling him Hubert. So Hubert is a fine name. Oh wait, I mean Huggy Wuggy. Stop! But more importantly, the design is actually quite good. The blue fur-like material paired up with the balloon-like mouth and wide eyes is a unique combination that works quite well. Some of the best character designs have some of the simplest design choices, and seeing such a lovable fluffy thing paired with the head biting beast we see him as later creates some nice juxtaposition which I was not expecting. To piggyback off of talking about the presentation a bit, Mob Games uses both Hubert and the setting of the game expertly to present an atmospheric experience. Take Hubert right here in the center. Now look very closely and while it might seem hard to tell through the compression of YouTube and the natural slight camera shake the game employs, Hubert right there is moving ever so slightly. And at first, when I looked at it again, I thought it might have been the wind brushing up against his fur, but it's an enclosed building. Please just trust me on this one. This is further aided by when Hubert is seen to go missing, and the addition of the toy blocks kicks in. When first walking into this room, most players, including myself, will have been so taken aback by Hubert. And when he leaves, the player immediately knows who's on the move. Hubert. This is undeniably what surprised me the most when playing this game. Not Hubert slightly moving when he is still, but the small design decisions that go a long way in guiding players in the right direction. All right, this is where my praises come to a screeching halt. The rest of the chapter kind of sucks. The general gameplay of Puppy Playtime revolves around puzzles which Sure, puzzles and horror have gone hand in hand quite well in the past, but all of these games, Security Breach, Hello Neighbor, Bending the Ink Machine, they all fall under that camp. I would have really liked to have maybe seen a different direction to distinguish itself from the crowd. Most of the puzzles revolve around this thing, the Grab Pack Reserve, which consists of two hands that can extend out to grab and interact with objects. This is a really cool idea, just in the wrong game. The entire gameplay of Chapter 1 revolves around these puzzles, requiring players to wrap wires around certain poles to divert 
convert power to certain parts of the map. I wouldn't mind this, but it just doesn't fit in the game. Something about how they implemented these puzzles in the game has me thinking these were just two ideas made for two different games. They feel boring. The general composition of these puzzles just doesn't interest me. Now, I would like to preface something that when someone says gameplay is supreme, I don't actually think that's the case. After playing the new Stanley Parable remake, I realized that what we should really be looking toward is the fun of a game. I know this may seem obvious, and while the gameplay is supreme saying is a good rule of thumb, here's what I mean by that. The Stanley Parable at its simplest is a walking simulator. However, people like myself derive fun from the game through its witty dialogue and quirky character moments. For a more controversial example, Slender is extremely dull from a gameplay perspective, but the horror is what drives it. Whether it's good horror is up for you to decide, but games like Slender, FNAF. On the topic of FNAF, here's a really good example. Take Bonnie's guitar minigame in Help Wanted. All you are doing is pressing a couple of buttons and playing a game of finding the off note. Oh, no we music here or something. But the towering Bonnie instills fear into the player. The simplicity is what keeps players' attention. It's a simple point A to point B, but getting to that point is spooky for some. Smaller horror flicks work because fear and horror are what drive the gameplay and tension. It becomes part of the fun. Now I mention all of this because Poppy potentially has the opportunity to use some other aspect in the base gameplay to enhance the experience. But they don't do any of that really. Chapter 1 instills some really cheap scares with a pipe valve going off here or just a loud unidentifiable noise there. This is the bare minimum and is such a lazy design decision. The best part of this game is the last 5 minutes. Okay, so after pissing around for a bit, right before you are going to enter a spooky dark hallway, Hubert shows up. The fact that Hubert is so towering over you is once again some nice juxtaposition in how usually toys are smaller and the humans are the ones that Sussy tower over them. Then the next bit involves a scripted chase sequence, which there is nothing wrong with this. Having variability, especially with a budget indie game like this, can create some programming challenges. The actual animation here had impressed me, especially regarding Hubert crawling through the vent. They made it look pretty natural. Those long, lanky limbs are extending far out towards you, and the jump scare was a lot better than I was expecting. So please incorporate some smoothing onto those teeth. They look straight out of a PS1 game. So then you run, and you die because you didn't go down the right path, and you do it again, and again, and uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Now you can call me bad, but this chase sequence in its trial and error format is a no-go. This chase scene is way too dependent on you knowing the correct route, and because of its decent length, repeat playthroughs just feel like I am pecking away at it. Though the ending is quite satisfying, with Hubert suffering a gruesome death. Well, at least that is until he comes back in a future chapter. Probably, I don't know. So then we go back to the boring gameplay, where we kind of just walk for an excessively long amount of time, and through a... Well, that was a lot more literal than I had thought. And then we open a glass case, spooky lights kick in, and yep, that's chapter one. Well, now free. Originally priced at $5, no. The game has quite a bit of polish in some areas, but chapter one was basically a tech demo. And thankfully, it's free now, as even for $5, it wasn't worth it. For $5, you got a boring, mediocre walking game with a spooky two-minute chase sequence at the end. Nice. Now, this was apparently a promising enough concept as it blew up into popularity and here we go with another chapter-based horror game. So overall, Chapter 2 has a lot of shoes to fill in. It's going to have to compel me enough to see this game till the very end. It needs to prove to me that this concept can be further expanded upon. It's out. Chapter 2! Well, Chapter 2 is, uh... It's kind of better. So we pick right back up from the end of chapter one. We go through some hallways again. Always nice to see. Then we enter the office of the like the main creator dude. This is fine. Already there is a big leap from chapter 1 to chapter 2. I found a golden flowy statue. You may have also noticed that sometimes there are these VHS tapes with CRT TVs scattered around. This is where you'll get your unhealthy dose of lore and yep, it's a... Uh, it's a spooky. Not really my cup of tea. Maybe it's burnout from all the other franchises with heavy lore such as FNAF and Bendy. But I could literally care less. It also just doesn't seem that original and oh boy we'll get back to that in a bit. Then finally we use the grab pack for an actual interesting mechanic. That being to swing across giant holes or cracks within the floor. This is pretty fun, and while it's not an element that can carry itself, it's still a nice evolutionary use of the grab pack. Also, Poppy gets taken away. More electric puzzles later, then we meet Mommy Longlegs, who is the main antagonist of this chapter. We'll call her Kyle. Again, I must compliment the animation. With such a stretchy and bendy character, they must have really been in a loop on animating this one. She begins to say some threatening things about eating me while I'm alive. 
I, I just don't care. Never in this game, in any of the chapters, did I ever feel truly intimidated. I know horror is subjective, but I feel as though this genre just hasn't had justice in recent years. Jumping ship a little bit, the main gameplay lies in the three mini games we have to complete in order to turn on the train, which will... Well, I guess it's gonna help us get out of here. The structure is simply way too repetitive. You start a game, you enter through the stairs, you need to solve some basic puzzles to get into the game, you play the game, and then you solve another puzzle to get out of the game and repeat. The lack of variation makes you feel like I'm playing the same thing over and over again. And the minigames themselves, I mean, they're the most basic of basic mechanically. And don't give me the argument that they are children's games, so having them being ungodly simple would fit within the universe. Well, it's boring, so boo-hoo. I don't know why developers keep implementing this. Hate to break it to you, Steel Wool and Mop Games, but Simon Says is not engaging. They took the monkey from Toy Story 3 and made it kind of a threat. Basically, if you take too long, then you die. Too bad I don't have any footage of the jump scare animation because, you know, it was easy. I appreciated and chuckled slightly at the more outrageous attempts to make the game harder. You know, by adding in different colors and symbols. But other than that, it was tiresome. Whack-a-mole, but Huber edition is next. And yep, same general concept. Not too awfully interesting. Well, I like the idea of Kyle watching over you, especially since you can only really see her silhouette. It doesn't really matter in the end because I'm so concentrated on whacking the little mini Huberts back. Look, it's not that these games aren't necessarily bad, but being presented as the main game gameplay loop and scare factor, they severely underdeliver in that regard. If they were maybe part of an optional quest or something, you know, acting as literal mini games in addition to the larger story, I would be fine with that. But no. Alright, so Squid Game Red Light Green Light is the final game. Just replace the giant doll with this here pug a pillar. It's probably the best game out of the three, especially since the grab pack has a more traversal use to it. You can cling onto the monkey bars and swing around, or you can just be like me and go on the ground the whole time and you'll still win. Seeing the ever approaching pug a pillar as you are completely still is an awesome sight to see. If only I could feel more threatened because this thing moves slower than your mom. Ha! Also, minor nitpick, there isn't like any direction that the game gives you on where to go, so I kept going and uh-oh. And um, excuse me, Mr. Dana Raid, you were actually supposed to cling on to this glowy orange pole and crash through the glass. How the hell was I supposed to know that? Markiplier made the same mistake if that validates my claim. These three games are the bulk of the experience. It's the main objective and Jiminy Crickets, why? You have so many possibilities. I just, I just feel like they blew it. To put into context how much fun I think these sections are, take the amount that Rafael Trzaskowski lost by in Poland's 2020 election, then divide that by 10,000, then divide it again by 20, <laughs> then add a percentage symbol at the end of the number. Perfect! And I know what you are saying. Well, there are still three chapters left and things could go for the upswing. Well, by chapter two, I should already be getting a good idea on the direction of your game. The main gameplay going forward is going to revolve around more puzzles in the grab pack, and there will be some kind of main objective that will require players to walk through lots and lots of hallways. I mean, do you know what chapter 2 ends with? Did you say a cinematic chase sequence? Sounds pretty similar to chapter 1 if I do say so myself. I do like the fact it's a little more involved with there being more stages to the sequence, and the actual build-up is very natural with Kyle getting mad at the player for cheating on her game during the Pug -a Pillar section, so it's not like chapter 1 where Hubert is like, boo, run away now. Still though, this time, the multiple stages of the frantic running involve players having to hide from Kyle, which wouldn't be so bad, but most of the time you aren't gonna realize you should have looked up to escape with the grab pack and you'll die and die and die. Uh-oh, we've run into the same problems as before. The last chase sequence isn't so much you trying to find a way to avoid her, instead it's you going down a specific path to eventually kill her. Oh my god, it's the same as chapter one! Made worse by the fact that the corridors and avenues players have to take are more elaborate, which means there is a lot more room for error. So you kill Kyle, and the prototype takes her away. What is the prototype? Well, I think it is quite obvious, Dana 8. The prototype is simply another version of Woodrow Wilson. This would further explain why he disappeared in all of your videos, because he then became the main antagonist of a much more successful and popular pro party. But hey, at least it makes more sense than the FNAF lore. Also, Dana 8 gets absolutely zero bitch. Apparently, the people at Playtime Co. were experimenting on kids, and somehow when kids get attached to a specific toy, they had their souls fused with that toy and wait, 
wait, isn't this just like FNAF? I can't be the only one to question the similarity and uncanniness between the two. And I don't even state that as a joke. While that might be the cliche route, you know what isn't? Immediately when playing this game, you know what immediately stuck out to me? It's striking similarities to Bendy and the Ink Machine. And look, I know I'm not the first one to point this out, but it bears mentioning. So without going any further, I dug deep and just for this video decided to play Bendy and the Ink Machine for the first time. Might I add, it wasn't that great. There are saved you 20 minutes of a hypothetical future Danaraid video. I will not be making a Bendy video, please don't ask. While you may be able to tell the surface similarities, both are set in abandoned locations, all the employees are missing, and the monsters in each game are reincarnated versions of other people. However, this is just scratching the surface. Scattered around in Bendy are these little cassette tapes that provide a little more detail into how this wacky world works, similar to the VHS tapes found in Poppy. Chapter 1 of both games end with a chase sequence. Now this part really bothers me because not only does Poppy seem to be using similar elements from a story perspective, but structurally, both games have their first chapters have players aimlessly walk around completing a couple of puzzles and then end with a chase sequence. It just seems a little too formulaic, you know? But what really surprised me was when I played chapter 2 of Bendy, where, as you guessed it, players basically play an elevated version of chapter 1 with more in-depth puzzles and it even ends with another chase sequence! Now, on the surface, that doesn't sound so bad? Well, of course the next chapter should be better than the last. Each game's first chapter is acted as little tech demos in a preview, a proof of concept per se. And while yes, that is true, let me tell you the bigger picture here. Is chapter one of either of these games bad? Well, I would say no, not necessarily. Their purpose was to show off a gameplay concept that could be elevated into a full-fledged experience. What falls short though is the potential. These games haven't been meeting our expectations. And see, that's the key here. The gaming audience likes these sort of games because they present new fresh ideas. Take Bendy. Similar to Poppy, it brings some juxtaposition to a horror setting, taking the nice friendly natured image of someone like the Walt Disney Company and instead flipping the script by creating a world with lies and deception. This idea is so compelling but then Bendy just had to get a little too greedy. I won't go into the whole history of Kindly Beasts and their little shenanigans but it isn't very good. But what is most insulting about these two games, and I guess we'll divert the attention back to Poppy, is the company's outlook on the game. The beauty about indie developers is that they aren't tied down to any marketing budgets or creative sacrifices, none of that. They get to make the product they want to make. Despite this, I see developers like Mob Games and Joey Juice Studios who put such a heavy emphasis on toy sales and movie deals, NFTs. These indie devs are feeling more like full-on game studios when really they should be honing in and bringing back what makes indies great, the little and inventive experiences they bring us. Instead, they presented us with a buggy mess. And yes, I know I haven't mentioned it, but I am well aware that Poppy Playtime Chapters 1 and 2 release in pretty horrific states. Though, to give them credit, at least for Chapter 2, they clean themselves up pretty quickly. They present us with basic experiences all covered by a good looking coat of paint. They present us with news of upcoming merch and tie-ins with other media companies. The reason I bring up Bendy and the Ink Machine, despite it being a general talking point, is that I've seen it already happen. They push toy sales when they shouldn't have, and now their one shining star is stuck in a wasteland full of bugs. Their new upcoming game is just in limbo on its development progress. And to cap it all off, they're being sued for half a billion dollars. Now, am I saying this is all going to happen to mob games? No, or at least I hope not. But with the formulaic nature the game is headed down, the countless apologies they have had to send out, it's not looking good in any way, in all aspects. Poppy Playtime left me feeling underwhelmed, and I didn't necessarily hate the experience, but it's something I wouldn't really want to play again. Is there hope for Poppy Playtime? Time will tell. But so far, by what I've seen, it's looking a tad bleak. Hiberta's animation makes up for everything. 10 out of 10 game.